Okay, so just want to thank you for coming to Transforming the Creative Process Through Research, Library Interventions for the Creative Disciplines. You'll see the closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. If you want to turn that off, you can. You just click the arrow next to Live Transcript CC and select uh, Hide Subtitle. We are recording this session, so all chats will be recorded, including private chats, so just keep that in mind. Oh, yeah. We're going to send recordings of sessions to anybody who registered for the conference. Uh, we ask that you keep yourself on mute unless you're one of the speakers or have a question. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat, so you can enter questions and comments there, and just make sure to use everyone when sending a chat to the group. Okay, so I'll turn it over. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Don, and thank you all for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and get things started. So, that. can everybody see the slides? Okay, I'm seeing nods and, and thumbs up. Wonderful. Okay, so welcome to Transforming the Creative Process Through Research, Library Interventions for the Creative Disciplines. I'm Jenny Dale. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Information Literacy Coordinator at UNCG, and I'm also a liaison librarian to a number of different departments. Um, but the one I'm going to be talking about today is um, the Creative Writing Program, which is part of the English department, and I will let Sarah and Maggie introduce themselves as well. I'm muted. Oh, <laughs> this is going very smoothly. So um, I'm head of, as you can see, head of the Harold Schiff Music Library. I am the, the uh, uh, geezer music librarian of the group. And um, I also liaise for theater and dance. So performing arts, but music really is the main thing I'll be talking about today. And uh, theater and dance gets short shrift, let me be honest about that. But I also just want to say really quickly here that I'm honored to be presenting with two of my research info lit heroes. Maggie. Hi, um, I'm Maggie Murphy. Uh, I am a visual art and humanities librarian. Um, and like Jenny and Sarah, I'm a liaison to a slew of different departments and programs. But mostly today, I'm going to be talking about the School of Art, um, which consists of studio art, art education, and art history programs. All right, awesome. Thank you both. And one thing that I just wanted to mention um, is actually two things I want to mention. One is that we will make these slides available. Um, so you'll see throughout the slides, we have lots of references links and resources and things like that. Um, so those will be made available. And the other is that if you have questions uh, or comments at any time, please feel free to use the chat. Um, I have the chat up and you also sometimes see me looking over here because I've got some links and things over here. Um, but yeah, just wanted to, to do my little um, Zoom spiel that I usually do when I'm teaching. So uh, the, the other thing that we want to do before we really jump into the content is to do a land acknowledgement. Um, and so we would like to acknowledge the lasting legacies of slavery and settler colonialism on the land on which we live and work, which is now Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, this land has long served as the site of meeting and exchange amongst a number of indigenous peoples, specifically the Kiawe and the Saura. Um, and we would like to honor and respect the diverse peoples who have been connected to this territory um, through time. Um, we also want to recognize that it's really impossible with where we live in, in the American South and North Carolina uh, to separate the history of this land um, from the history, long history and lasting legacies of slavery. So we want to give that acknowledgement. And then I want to tell you what we're going to do today. So we're going to give kind of a brief literature review. Um, what's already out there in terms of information literacy, library support, research support for the creative disciplines. We're going to go into a couple of case studies from our liaison areas, and then we're going to do a little bit of reflecting at the end. And we're going to start with a literature review. And I'm going to talk about creative writing first, but I wanted to also just kind of situate this so that you know why I got interested in this and why I pulled Sarah and Maggie into this presentation. Um, so I have worked with the English department at UNCG as a liaison um, since 2010. So 11 years at this point, um, there is a English department graduate, Dusty Ross here in the presentation. So welcome Dusty. Um, so I've had lots of opportunities to work with literature courses, with first year writing courses, just sort of all over the place. But 
I had never gotten in for a research session with a creative writing class. And before the spring semester of 2021, um, a uh, one of our creative writing faculty members who also actually has an MLS and used to be a librarian contacted me and asked me to work with her advanced fiction and um, grad seminar for creative nonfiction. And I was super excited because I've been wanting to do this for a while, but I realized I just wasn't sure how to approach it. Um, and so I started to look to see what was out there. Um, what have other people done in terms of information literacy for creative writers? So that's kind of how I got interested in figuring this out. Um, and there's not a ton out there in the literature um, that connects information literative writing, but there are a few sources. So Julia Glassman, who is an academic librarian at UCLA, or at least was at the time of writing this article, um, and also a novelist, um, argues in an article that the extent to which creative writing students conduct research, both formal and informal for their work, is still vastly underestimated. Fiction writers and poets tend to be viewed as artists who, at their core, need only a notebook and a pen to write. However, access to information resources is crucial to producing solid stories and poems. And uh, one of the few other sources that I was able to find in our LIS literature was a piece written by um, John Glover from VCU. Um, and he talked about a, um, a really semester long kind of embedded relationship he had with an MFA novel writing class. And he specifically identified some skills um, that creative writers need, particularly fiction writers. And he, he mentioned that, you know, in his experience, these are grad students getting an MFA. So they have some experience with research just based on whatever they studied in undergrad. And they might even have some pretty advanced skills from upper level English courses, other requirements that they might have taken. But he said they typically don't have this combination and I've added this emphasis here of historical, investigative, image and general research skills that he thinks are necessary for novel writing and that most professional authors or novelists are gonna develop over time. Um, so he took this embedded approach um, which was meant to sort of mimic, I think this process of slowly building your skills as a researcher um, who is also working on a long form fiction piece. And he split this into units, which, is, which were library research, primary sources, finding images, advanced web searching, researcher practices, government documents, investigating people and publishing resources. So this was the first article that I found when I was thinking about approaching these courses and I was immediately like overwhelmed because I was like, oh no, these are all so important. How am I going to teach them? I only have 45 minutes um, because I knew I was going to have not even full one shot sessions with these classes. It was really like half the class, um, half the class session for the undergrad and like just the first 45 minutes of the session for the MFA class I was working with. So I had to, I had to like, you know, slow my roll a little bit and calm down because I realized there was no way I was going to be able to cover all of this. Um, and later we'll get into the case studies. I'll, I'll let you um, let you in on the approach that I ultimately took. Glassman talks about a, an approach that I'd like to try more in the future and it's a resource based approach. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, I definitely recommend her article because she actually gives examples of classroom exercises using different resource types. Um, types that I wouldn't necessarily have thought of. So I wouldn't have necessarily thought, oh, subject encyclopedias would be great for a fiction or creative nonfiction class, but they would. And she gives some examples of um, activities that she did with sort of more of the standard, you know, encyclopedia of philosophy or sort of the more off the wall kind of interesting subject encyclopedias that many of us have access to. And she also talks about using online databases, a, a variety of different kinds, including our scholarly subscription databases or other databases, searchable collections that can be found online. An example that she also gave is working with special collections. So again, she's at UCLA and in their special collections, they have Raymond Chandler's manuscripts. And so she worked with a course um, or that she took them to special collections and they could see the physical manuscripts and see what the actual fiction writing process looked like for this one particular author. Uh, and she also has some examples related to image repositories and then just like general research guides, both library created and just guides that are out there online. So 
those are two of the really main sources in our LIS literature that actually talk about creative writing. But um, I am going to just want to talk a little bit about framework connections. Both, both of those articles were actually written pre-framework. Um, the John Glover article does talk about the ACRL information literacy competencies. Um, but when I was reading these, I was immediately making a lot of framework connections. Because if you know me, I work with the framework a lot. It's important to my work. Um, and I sort of can't help but think about it when I am looking at uh, a sort of teaching problem. And so I, I could make connections in terms of creators and what they need with information literacy skills with pretty much all six of the framework frames. But three that really stood out to me are authority is constructed and contextual. Um, and that's, I think about that in terms of one of the reasons that creative writers do research is so that they can establish an authoritative voice. Um, and you'll see when I give some examples later that the students I worked with referred to this a little bit differently. They called it authenticity, but I think we're talking about the same thing. Researchers inquiry is definitely the next one that really came, came out to me. And these other two, researchers inquiry and searching a strategic exploration are the ones I focused on in the courses and the class sessions that I'll talk about during our case studies. But with researchers inquiry, you know, everything I have been able to find about creative writers and their research is that they've got to be able to ask questions and then they have to be able to appropriately scope their questions. And then for searching and strategic exploration, you saw in both of those examples, there are so many resources out there, so many, both of those articles, I mean, that I talked about, so many resources out there and it's important to help any research, researcher, but in my case, creative writers, match the, their need to the right tools or to the right strategies. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Maggie. Okay, I am unmuted. Um, so I'm gonna do briefly what Jenny just did, but um, uh, with art and design fields, um, we, uh, don't have an architecture program at UNCG. We have an interior architecture program, which is actually part of the College of Arts and Sciences and not part of the College of Visual and Performing Arts, but is co-located in the Studio Art Building. Um, uh, and so um, it's easier to say art and design in this case is sort of just to build it in. Um, so I was surprised when Jenny told me that there was a relative dearth of research and writing about um, information literacy instruction for creative writing because, oh boy, is there a lot about art. Um, and uh, like art librarianship is actually like an identity, you know, that that uh, for, for many um, librarians that work with the arts, um, I'm actually, this has nothing to do with um, the current presentation, uh, and this is a terrible link, um, but I was trying to recall the, the bell hooks, um, phrase uh, art is the practice of freedom because that is invoked in one of the classes I'm gonna talk about. Um, but that in searching for that, I remembered that that's also a title of an article about um, relationship between librarians and artists and developing a social justice oriented art librarian identity. Um, so in any case, uh, just briefly looking at the information seeking habits and needs of practicing artists, um, there are these different categories of things. Uh, so creative inspiration. And this is really um, where some of the differences between um, visual art and some other fields, not really explicitly different than creative writing or music, but um, that you're not always researching in search of an answer to a question or a solution to a problem. Um, the, the idea that creative research um, is a habit that you have to regularly engage in, like exercise, uh, you know, it, um, to just expose yourself to new things, to browse, to encounter, to look. Um, and so uh, that's one need. And then the other ones are pretty um, easily relatable to many other professional fields. Um, things about materials and techniques, um, identifying and locating specific visual references. Um, so you are looking for if a painting, you know, um, by someone that looks like something or. Um, you're looking for examples of door columns or something like that. And then professional or career information. Um, and this is especially important for our MFA students who um, are uh, about to have to start marketing themselves, you know, um, applying for fellowships, things like that. 
But so I'm really going to focus on that creative inspiration um, part of uh, artistic research practice. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, Jenny. Um, so, oops, sorry. Um, so yes, the idea that creative research is iterative and multimodal. And again, this is not totally specific to art. It, it applies to a lot of creative disciplines. Um, but that, uh, you know, research is not something you do before you start making art and that iterative aspect, very familiar for any info lit, you know, scenario, research isn't something that starts before you start writing your research paper, it's part of it. Um, it's not like a, a linear process. Um, and also importantly, the research needs of uh, artists are idiosyncratic in that anything can be inspiring. Um, so the idea of, you know, building an image or art collection for artists, um, they're not just looking for examples from and of fine art and art history, but things like maps, you know, uh, biological diagrams, you know, all kinds of things are going to be inspiring to artists. Um, uh, that they continue to have a preference for browsing and continue to have a preference for browsing for print materials. Um, uh, but that this is something that develops um, from, uh, sorry, uh, from, from their education and from learning from other artists. So it's not like um, a uh, sort of intuitive preference, um, but something that is also taught as an artistic practice. Next slide. Um, so this is just a quote um, from a book uh, by an artist about um, research and art. And I can't remember the title of the book off the top of my head, but this is in our bibliography. Um, and so this is something that in the first class I'm going to talk about, we really tried to impress upon students um, that this isn't like an external kind of push um, from a scholarly standpoint of uh, getting them to use the library and to do research and to learn how to cite, but it's actually part of art making. Um, and so this is talking about browsing in the stacks as part of art making, um, you know, by uh, sort of this is, is a perfect link really to research as inquiry, um, but being open um, and inquisitive and spending time looking at things and thinking, um, you know, adds to your artistic potential and your productivity. Uh, next one. So um, in addition to uh, the framework for information literacy and the current ACRL standards for visual literacy, um, in higher education, uh, that tech, uh, that one is going to get yanked in the fall and be replaced with a, a framework also, um, but uh, as guides for information literacy for art fields, um, the Art Library Society of North America, which is Artless NA, um, has developed uh, its own set of information competencies. Um, and so these are um, more uh, standard based um, in terms of specific outcomes. Um, and they have them for all of these different fields. And so they originally published in 2006. And then the revision was a really big expansion that was much more um, uh, differentiated by field. And uh, there were three subsequent waves of that uh, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Um, and if you go to the next, uh, slide, Jenny. Um, so using the framework as a sort of guide um, and the, uh, the understanding by design framework by Wiggins and McTeague, McTie, Jenny knows. McTie. McTie. Um, the, the idea of um, there being essential questions to a discipline um, that uh, are these sort of like big ideas to tackle. Um, I'm probably not explaining it super well. Um, but these are these are the the big framing questions um, that through many different assignments <laughs> and experiences and things over time, um, these are these are questions that a student would be able to answer um, about their discipline. Um, and so uh, these are examples of essential questions from the June 18 document um, that are at the beginning as sort of a framing device for those specific learning outcomes and competencies. So things like what questions drive your creative work? How do these evolve over time? Um, what interpretive frameworks or theoretical lenses help you make meaning? So again, getting into that multimodal aspect of research, you know, not just visual references, but what, what ideas, what written ideas, what ideas from other fields 
Um, and then questions getting into some of the um, other frames, uh, you know, questioning your, or your own worldviews, assumptions, biases um, through reflective process. Uh, that is a nice tie to authorities constructed and contextual. Um, and thinking about ethical and creative integrity concerns. Um, that's a nice tie to information has value. Um, and so you can see that this is very framework influenced, but very specific to art and design. Uh, and lastly, um, so uh, again, like I said at the very beginning, there is a lot of stuff that has been written about information literacy for art and design. Um, and uh, a lot of it um, has come out after the framework. Um, and so there's a lot of direct references to the framework in some of these texts. And I realized after the fact that I, I picked uh, a bunch of readings that are <laughs> really in this 2015 to 2017 moment, but they continue to come out. These were, I think these were influential at the time because they made these specific connections to specific frames um, in different uh, artistic practices. Um, and uh, they're all from um, art documentation, except for um, the Meeks et al. Uh, article, which was in college and research libraries. And that is more framed um, for a general audience uh, about these dispositions and practices. Um, and uh, so all of this is in our bibliography. And I think that's it for me, right? Yes. Okay. So this is so interesting because I mean, I'm just realizing now that art is like totally the winner um, and creative writing maybe taken up the rear. So music is somewhere in the middle uh, <laughs> with, with what's there. And um, yeah, you can move to the next slide. I have a couple of notes here because I'm nonlinear and you wouldn't want to hear me blather. But anyway, so I don't want to say that music librarians are slow to adapt, but I don't think we are as far along as art. Um, yeah, so we're somewhere in the middle there. But um, there's not yet a web presence that music librarians can use to help them with InfoLit um, and the framework, uh, the way. And there is something that's still there, but it's from the before the framework and it uses BI. So I didn't really want to link to it, um, just FYI, yeah. So yeah. Um, anyway, so this is a collection of essays. It's really valuable given that there's not a lot out there about music in the framework. And it helps uh, uh, us wonderful, you know, us music librarians. So yeah, the next slide is good. So I like this quote because it highlights some of the specialness of musicians, many of whom spend hours isolated practicing their instruments. And it's a good way to frame what all music info lit folks are aiming for. Okay, the next slide. So the authors, Snyder, Samsel, and Farmer, who wrote the first chapter of this book, um, they connect the framework with the old MLA standards at the end of their article with a handy chart. And um, yeah, here are some of the uh, examples. So to highlight one of them, information as a creative process. In Western art music, in the Western art music tradition, which music is struggling to address, but that's another conversation, there is a composition. Then there is a premiere of the composition. And then there are reviews of that premiere of the composition and other performances of that composition. And then the score gets published. And then there are recordings from that score by various people. And then the scholarly in inquiry. So every step of the way is a different kind of um, information and the, the uh, challenge of formats is something that I will come back to. Um, yeah, so the multitude of processes and moments of creation are clear. Okay, next slide. Erin um, Connor has published and presented on the framework and is a champion of it. This is a case study. Um, and one of her examples includes using a bibliography as the beginning of an assignment, not the end. So the students has the scholarly conversation in front of them, and it's easier to join the conversation in that situation. Obviously, this is uh, this kind of approach is uh, facilitated by the embedded situation here, not so much for the one shot uh, situations. So on to case studies. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, I agree with you, Sarah. It sounds like 
It sounds like maybe I need to write an article. I think maybe, yeah. I mean, I think that maybe what's what's next. Um, you heard it here, y'all. <laughs> here, yes, here we go. Spoilers, it's happening. Um, we are going to ask for you to do a very quick poll for us at this point. We've been talking for a little bit. Um, and we're going to use Ventimeter, which you will see when I go into my case study is something that I use obsessively um, when, when I'm teaching. Um, so you can either go to the link and code that's on the screen and that I just posted in the chat, or if you have a QR code enabled phone, you can grab that QR code off of the screen and answer the question there. It's just one question, multiple choice, uh, just to give us a sense of, you know, where you are with this topic. So I'll give you a moment to answer that, and then I will pull up our results. Okay, I'm going to grab the results up on the screen here. Okay, so I asked you this question, do you or any of your colleagues provide library instruction to courses in the creative disciplines? There are a number of UNCG folks here. Um, so you can all say yes, because you're here watching our presentation. So you know that we do this. Um, we have one person who said, you know, definitely no. And then we have a couple of people who just aren't sure. Um, and that is cool. We were just curious to sort of find out, is this something that is being done regularly? Um, and I think what both uh, both Maggie and Sarah talked about this a little bit, there are um, art librarian and music librarian like identities. It's a type of librarianship that you choose to go into that you build up your skills in. And there's really not that for uh, for creative writing in the same way. Um, but I do wanna to talk to you a little bit about what I did with the courses that I got to work with this semester. Um, so the first course I'll discuss is English 425, which is advanced writing. Um, and this is a, it was mostly seniors in this class, but it could have been a junior and senior level, upper level undergrad creative writing um, course. And so, as I said, I always use Mentimeter. Um, so I have here a PDF of my Mentimeter results, just so that you know what I sort of opened with. So with this class, I asked initially, why do fiction writers need to develop research skills? Um, and, and this is where that concept of authenticity came up quite a bit. Several people mentioned it specifically. I know this is hard to see, but again, you'll have access to these slides, so you will be able to kind of get to this on your own and make it bigger so that it is actually legible. Um, people also use terms like believability, or they wanting their stories to be believable. Um, so again, you know, this to me connects back to that idea of authority. Um, and then I asked them just to talk a little bit about their own practice as fiction writers and what kind of research they've done. And it was a range. Um, so some students were like, yeah, I just, I Google sometimes. Um, and then sometimes students were like, oh, I like this one, for instance, is one, make this a little bit bigger that I laughed at because they're talking about having to do research on the 80s um, as a time that they didn't experience. So um, it was a, a bit of a blow um, in terms of making me feel old, but uh, useful because it gave me sort of a good jumping off point for the group scenario-based activity. I do a lot of scenario-based activities with classes and I use Google Docs a lot when I'm teaching. Um, so this is just an example of how I have done that. Um, I This was a pretty small class. Um, so I just had students split up into two groups and go into these Google Docs. Um, and I just made copies of them so you can see this is literally what they added. Um, so I gave them three scenarios, um, and for each scenario, I said, go into this Google Doc and just throw any ideas you have in here. So scenario one, you're writing a story set in a fictional West African nation. What research will help you effectively create the setting? So I wanted to have a scenario about place. The second one is a scenario about time. It's your, home, your own hometown, but it's during World War I. So how are we going to authentically represent the time period? And then the third scenario is based on character. 
Um, and this is, uh, you're developing a character who has the medical condition fibromyalgia. What research will help you carefully present the challenges a character with this condition might face? And actually in both groups, this is the one that students really um, kind of got interested in the most in terms of thinking about how they would approach it. So for me, this activity, primarily I was, I was thinking of it as a research's inquiry activity, but actually a few of them identified like specific types of tools or search engines or types of sources that they would use. So it ended up slipping a little bit into that searching and strategic exploration. Then I moved into just asking this framing question. This was getting towards searching and strategic exploration. And my question was, who cares? Um, and not in a flippant way, like who cares about this, but who cares enough about this topic to be collecting the information that you're going to need? And then I moved them um, into looking at our research guide. So I, with that, who cares? I went through the different scenarios and said, here are some groups or people or professions of people who might be collecting this information. Um, and then I went into the research guide, which you will also have access to, and which includes the slides that I used with this class. Um, with the research guide for this class, I focused again on those sort of three potential like pathways or starting points, place, time, and character. Um, and one of the things I tried to reiterate to students many times throughout this session is because you're fiction writers and you could be writing about anything at any time happening to anyone, there's no way to provide sort of a comprehensive list of resources. So that's why I tried to approach it with them as, okay, here's some starting points. Um, and this might also help you think about different kinds of resources that you could use, even if these aren't the exact ones you need. Uh, and so, yeah, that's what I did with the fiction writing course. Um, the next one was creative nonfiction, um, which was the grad seminar, part of the MFA program. Once again, I did Mentimeter, like I said, I always do it. Uh, Johnny from Mentimeter emails me pretty regularly if you're a Mentimeter user, I get it. So I started in this case, I didn't feel like I had to, um, I guess I didn't feel like I needed to like try to get them on board to the idea that like, or with the idea that research is important. Not only are they in an MFA program, but they're in a creative nonfiction course, right? So many of them are gonna be writing essays about all kinds of different things. So I, I just had a sense coming in that they'd be like, uh, yeah, you don't need to, you know, kind of, you know, win us over to this idea that we have to do research. We know we have to do research. So I just asked them something they've researched or wanted to research. And one of the things I liked about this too is that they just shared a wide range um, of different things that they had researched in the past or might be interested in researching in the future. And then the next thing I did was to ask them about their confidence level with a few different specific skills. So I asked, how confident are you in your ability to choose the right place to start research? And this was pretty high confidence. Um, the, the lowest two were their confidence in being able to search the UNCG library catalog, our specific catalog, um, and to create effective search strings. They're very high, they're most highly confident in being able to locate relevant primary sources, um, and then a bit less in terms of integration um, of those sources in effectively into creative nonfiction piece. So that just gave me a sense of where they were coming from. Um, we tried a collaborative who cares activity. We, I tried a collaborative who cares activity in this class and it did not go well. Um, so I thought I would share this with you as well. I just made a PDF of this one, um, but this was an editable Google doc. Um, and I used two example topics of things that I knew they were going to be reading about because I was embedded in their Canvas course, which made this a bit easier. So I knew they had some upcoming reading about messenger pigeons and about artificial intelligence and robots. So I tried to um, sort of double up in this case and do sort of the who cares, who might be interested in this, what could we look for? And then also what are some search terms we could use? So tried to sort of kill no pun intended, two birds with one stone here, but uh, it did not work well. Um, it started out okay, and then it just sort of devolved. Um, so as we got into the artificial intelligence one, some of the search terms that came out were great, but um, they were just kind of, you know, 
kill, kill two, killing two messenger pigeons with one AI robot. Um, thank you, Maggie, from the chat. Um, so yeah, so the this it just didn't go quite as well as I wanted, um, but that's okay. That happens, right? That's why we try things. Um, and then what I really focused on was, especially as I was seeing their responses here that made me think, oh, they're like in this case, they're really used to searching Google. Like these are very Google style searches with the pluses. That's like next level Google style searching. But I didn't get a sense that like, oh, they, they seem like they're really comfortable creating search strings. And that reflected what they had said in that initial um, Mentimeter poll. So I talked about advanced search techniques and then I demonstrated some. Um, so I showed our library catalog, some different multidisciplinary databases. I got pretty overwhelmed actually um, as I was preparing for this class and you'll see from the research guide I created, I have so much on here. There's so many different options because again, even more so than fiction, even more so than something like English 101 where our students can choose any topic they want. This is like in English 101, I can usually take them to academic search complete because they're usually researching sort of contemporary topics and we can find something for everyone. But in this case, you know, if you're, you know, researching messenger pigeons in Greensboro in the 19th century, academic search complete isn't going to help you. You're going to have to be able to seek out something a lot more specific. Um, so then I also, and this was a request from the professor was to have some primary uh, historical and primary source databases. And I went, I went all out on this. This, is, this took me a long time. Um, and then I decided because I felt like, oh, there's just like all it's just stuff. So I decided that I really wanted to go with that pathways or starting points like I had done with the 400 level class. So I did end up adding this section. Um, that this tab where I have them different pathways researching a place, a time period, and a person. So the same kind of ideas as that fiction course, um, but a little bit different. So those are my case studies. If I were to do these again, I would approach some things differently. Um, but um, it was really rewarding to finally be able to work with some creative writing classes. All right, turning it over to Sarah. Thank you, Jenny. I really want to take one of your classes. Okay, let's just talk the next time you, you do creative nonfiction. Okay. Um, so I wanted to just mention something before I, that I meant to say earlier about music, music librarians. And so don't tell anybody, but I'm not a member of ALA. I'm not an, I'm a member of ACRL. I, I can only afford Music Library Association. And that's my professional home. So one of the reasons that I think there might be a disconnect between the framework and music librarians is that disconnect. But anyway, that's just a thought I wanted to put out there. So yes, how is music different? OMG, right. It happens in time. And um, as I said earlier, primary sources include all sorts of things that don't necessarily um, happen in other um, disciplines. So one of the things that I wanted to say, um, yeah, and this is true of all performing arts and also performance art. So the lines blur some here, but in the days of multiple records and databases all looking alike, I find one of the challenges is simply identifying what the format is of something because it's difficult to locate and cite and engage with a source if you don't know what the format is. So um, I'm, I'm just gonna talk briefly about some of my particularly musical moments in information literacy and then focus a little on a class that I'm embedded in. So next slide, miscellaneous musical moments. Oh yeah, I do like alliteration. Um, so my background, bachelor's and master's is in music. I was an organ major, but then I realized that playing in church was not for me. So I dropped the organ, started playing the cello. Then I played the mandolin. So do you see the trend? It's much easier to carry a mandolin than a cello or an organ, of course. Now I'm starting on the ukulele, maybe next the piccolo, I don't know. But I, I've been a member of the UNCG Old Time Ensemble for years, though not, alas, during COVID. Um, this group plays the indigenous music of North Carolina and the delight of being a music librarian in the midst of a peer group of performers never grows old. And all of the students have to locate songs to perform in small groups, and they have to introduce their songs with information that they find at the performance. So sharing the delight of how to do that was fun and a direct form of information literacy, you know, of a peer kind. Um, and that information creation, both sound and scholarly was a process we all shared. Um, so in the past, because at UNCG, we happen to have the largest collection of cello music in the world. Yes, yes, 
the rumors are true. So I would visit the cello studio in the past. Um, now that this collection has grown exponentially, our special collections librarians reach out and the studio just goes over there. But if I had more time, I would certainly push for more studio visits um, with all kinds of instruments. So program notes are gaining in popularity again as a way for performers to engage with the music they make with a different frame, so to speak. Um, requiring them is not yet there, but we're working on it with the grad students. But the value of establishing their authoritative voice in this very practical way makes total sense to me. So I'm an adjunct music graduate faculty member of the School of Music and some of my research, for some of my research, I'm working on a biography of a 20th century composer, pianist and pedagogue, Louise Talma. One of my tasks as a music adjunct is serving on doctoral committees. So there have been a couple on Talma. I didn't bribe them. Bribe them. Um, uh, but again, being part of that scholarly conversation by being first reader on their documents was such a rush. And there was another dissertation that grew out of a conversation that organically became a portrait of music protesters working with indigenous folks in the Pacific Northwest, where else, um, and winning against a coal mine um, port going in. Yes, I'm a sustainability nut. Next slide. So I was given a gift of being embedded in a class that is required for all music majors over 10 years ago. Theoretically, they take it their freshman year. Um, it's a world music class and I have learned lots as ethnomusicology was not on the menu at my schools. Um, as mentioned earlier, I organized some of my assignments around the plethora of formats available. But one of the cool things about world music at, is that trying to convince students expecting Bach, Beethoven and Brahms to think globally can be a challenge. But once they get that that blue ball in space thing, I'm able to loop in some of my other service work on sustainability and give them extra credit to go to my sustainability film and discussion series. I love to say we're all in the spaceship together. And one way we can decolonize music is to remind these young folks to take care of the spaceship. Now that's a conversation that gets me all excited. Okay, Maggie, you artist, take it away. Okay, um, so uh, I, I'm going to start. I have three classes to just briefly talk about. Um, the first is our Studio Art Foundations class. Um, and so uh, this is already called Studio Art Foundations. And now there is a specific category of courses calls, uh, called Foundations um, uh, as part of our general education plan. Um, and we, we don't have a lot of time left in this presentation, so I'm not going to belabor a lot of these points. Um, this class uh, is specifically um, about uh, what it means to be an artist and what, a, what you do as an artist. Um, and so uh, it has elements of um, uh, like it, the course description is connect the dots between creative productive habits, scholarly pursuits and professional planning. Um, and so this class is online, high enrollment. Um, it's mostly asynchronous with weekly guest lectures. Um, mostly from practicing artists. And so my role in this class is to introduce the concept of research um, and uh, the, the technique to do so, as I discussed um, with the, uh, the course director, who's also the director of undergraduate studies in, in the School of Art, um, is to situate myself as a fellow artist. Um, and uh, so that I have a sort of dual, dual domains of authority. You know, I'm talking to them as um, an information professional and also as someone um, who does what they want to do or are doing. Um, and so ideally, if you are sort of or introducing creative research, um, you would maybe want to take a class to look at some art books in the stacks um, and, you know, introduce browsing and all of those things that I mentioned earlier. Um, but because this is an online only class and I'm lecturing virtually, um, uh, I decided that the easiest way to sort of demonstrate and model um, uh, dispositions and practices from search as strategic exploration and research as inquiry, um, it was to use an online tool called Google Keep um, and to show how it works. Um, I don't think, yeah, that'll work right now because I wanted to show the one that I had set up for demonstration purposes. Um, if you are at all interested in this lesson plan, I would be happy to talk to uh, you afterwards. Um, and in the slides, which you'll have access to, um, you can check out uh, the slideshow that I use as the beginning sort of lecture for this, um, and also my research guide um, uh, for the class, which isn't, 
you know, an assignment based research guide. It's more of um, a resource guide, I guess. Uh, so the next class um, is, you want to, there we go. Um, so this is actually a hands on art class outside of the College of Visual and Performing Arts, um, located in one of the residential colleges. Um, and so the residential colleges are sort of probably not classically defined as living learning communities. Um, uh, and um, so this is a three hour, three credit face-to-face -face class. There's a 15 student um, cap on the enrollment. Um, and uh, I helped develop this class with the instructor. Um, and uh, so this one, uh, I am embedded throughout the class. There's five different, um, sessions that I teach. Uh, and um, it also involves other, again, guest lecturers who talk about specific elements of art and activism, punk music, uh, fiber art, <laughs> um, and like uh, transgressive stitching, you know, things like that. Um, and so the lesson plan uh, that is here um, is, a, is a zine making workshop. And again, um, I have linked to uh, the Google site that we created for this class, which instead of a a libguide because um, it's uh, the, the students in this class make a Google site later in the semester. Um, so it's again another way to sort of model ahead of time the technology. Um, and so uh, if you um, have ever seen any sort of zine making lesson plan tied to fair use and the framework and things like that, this isn't that um, uh, mind blowing or anything. But with zines, it's really easy um, to talk about the connections between format and process. Um, and it's anyone can make a zine. Um, and so uh, we um, introduce zines and then we actually make them with students. And we have been 100% virtual uh, this year um, at UNCG Libraries, virtual instruction. Uh, and so it has been fun <laughs> to, to demonstrate how to make zines um, virtually uh, with like a little camera set up um, and uh, my colleague Melody and I do this. Um, and then uh, we get to see it from beginning to end. They're participating in the creation of a specific uh, format. Um, and then the last one, this is a planned collaboration. Um, and uh, I, um, I won't get too much into it. So this isn't something that we have done yet. Um, but what I wanted to emphasize um, in this uh, collaboration is just that um, this faculty member brought to me specific pedagogical issues that she wanted to address um, through an information literacy assignment um, based on her experiences in her first year at the institution. Um, at the capstone level, uh, she didn't feel like they had really developed information and visual literacy skills through research before they had to do a research-based project, um, that their artistic development is being stifled by the algorithmic digital landscape um, with suggestion algorithms, just browsing Instagram, it shows you more of what you're looking at, you know, it refines itself over time. Um, and so you're not seeing, you're not having those sort of serendipitous encounters with other ideas, um, you know, other, other things that may spark your inspiration that you're not already interested in. Um, and then the, the digital darkroom is a digital photography and Photoshop class. Um, and so she actually wants them to ground their digital production techniques in analog research and creation techniques. Um, and so we developed uh, an assignment. This also involves making the zine, but a completely different kind. Um, uh, and again, if you wanna talk more about this assignment, um, I can share the questions and readings and things, um, but this is a, a new collaboration. So we haven't actually, this is for fall 21. Um, so uh, maybe check in with me then and I'll let you know if it worked out or not. All right, thank you both. So just a, a few last things, some reflections. Um, so thinking back on sort of lessons learned from, from the work that we've done here, um, you know, one of the things that I noticed in the classes I worked with that I've sort of already addressed is this idea that with my creative writing students, they like get it, they, they believe in the value of research. Um, but when I was talking to, to Maggie actually yesterday about this, I was like, do you think this statement that students recognize the value of research to support creative projects is true? She said, yes, with art students, but they may not think of what they're doing as research in a sort of traditional sense of the word. Um, so I think that's interesting. And it goes back to, to the quote, a quote that she had earlier. Um, and, and the quote 
ended the which was the one from an artist writing a book about research ended with this idea that like uh, your sort of capacity for this expands as it goes. Um, so that's something I'm really interested in and thought a lot about with with these reflections and and hearing Sarah too talk about the um, you know, increased interest in these sort of program notes, researched program notes as being an, an assignment that might be expected, even if not required. Um, and one of the things too that I think when, when we've seen these case studies is that, um, you know, one of the habits of mind that I think we're always trying to help students develop within information literacy is some mental flexibility, some creativity with the research process. And I think these students are, um, sort of predisposed to be able to do that kind of thing because that's their training. They may not explicitly connect it to research, um, but it's maybe a connection that we can draw out. Uh, and, and you can think of it as metacognition sometimes, you know, that it's they step back and they see things. That can help with it too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, future plans, Maggie talked about the awesome course that she's gonna do. Um, one of my, things that I would like to do with the creative writing class when things get back to a bit more normal um, is to do a collaborative session with special collections. The uh, grad course that I worked with actually did a whole separate uh, instruction session with spe special collections. I'm not even sure exactly what happened there. So I'd like to have like sort of a, a collaborative session where we can really draw from each other. Um, and I think particularly, like I said, there's not enough about creative writers. So I think that it would be interesting to do some surveying or interviewing to find out more. And I think that um, even for music and studio art, where there is more literature on this, we could learn things from our students, but what they're doing and what they're using, what they're interested in. Uh, and so our sort of final thing is a moment of reflection for you. Um, and so we're going to ask you to think briefly and then share in the chat. And what we're going to ask you to think about is how might you or your library. We've talked about mostly instructional stuff here with some, um, you know, some of Sarah's sort of additional examples built in like the old time ensemble. Uh, but what are some things that you or your library could do to support students who are in these creative disciplines in new ways? Would you, you know, have an art exhibit in the library um, from students? Not an instruction thing, but it would be a way that we could support students in these processes. So um, just give you a moment to think, but we would love for you to share some ideas in the chat. Awesome. So I see um, Dawn, we regularly have art exhibits, so we rotate out each year. I love that. Um, Megan, oh, okay. So I like this. So Megan, there are actually a couple of people who've started writing about nano remote programs in academic libraries. So I think that's a really cool idea. Um, poetry reading, student poetry reading, I love that idea. Um, like sort of maybe jumping it, jumping in on things that people are already doing, but just bringing the library to it. Christine, introducing students to some of our digital archive collections. Sarah mentions open mic nights. I think there are a lot of ways beyond sort of you know traditional classroom things that we could do. Um, Kelly introduces art and theater and dance students to the maker space. That's really cool. I like that idea. And feel free to keep adding to the chat, but also um, if anyone has any questions, comments, um, anything like that at this point, please feel free to ask those. And I will say thank you and give you a link to our um, bibliography and our slides, which I will put both of them in the chat. Okay, I see some more chats that came in. Dusty says, and I love the question, what have you researched before? It's such a fun list, takes way to get students to engage. Oh yeah, Dusty, I have all kinds of opening Mentimeter questions I'd be happy to share with you. It's fully something I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and people are saying, thank you, thank you. We appreciate you. Um, and we have our bibliography and slides. Um, and yeah, any other questions, comments? Thank you for hanging in for the last session of the day. Uh, 
I went ahead and grabbed those links to the bibliography and slides. I'll share those out when I send out all the videos. So. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Donna. Yes. Uh, Maggie, I did not hear you, Chair, so you're all good. Oh. <laughs> I don't see any other comments or questions. So I'm just, we don't have a formal closing to this conference. We were just going to kind of wrap it up at the end of the three o'clock sessions and just let everybody know how much we appreciated them coming and presenting and sharing all their information. And of course the recordings and slides and whatnot will be emailed out. And if you were the winner of one of our drawings, we're gonna email you for that as well. So, all right. Well, thank you all so much. This has been a wonderful Bye. conference. I enjoyed the presentation. Yeah, thank you. This was <laughs> an awesome conference. Thanks for letting us be part of it. All right, take care everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.